And I never saw one woman or young girl or, you know, who came into Planned Parenthood who seemed liberated. If anything, they, they walked in and out and there was a shame. There was a look of shame, you know? I never saw them come in and I thought to myself, oh, wow, look at her. She's so empowered, you know? I never saw that. Welcome to Matters of Soul Importance, where we dive deeply into topics of both earthly and eternal consequence. I'm Roxanne Solonen, faith columnist and features writer for The Forum, author, and speaker. In this episode, I ask former Planned Parenthood manager Ramona Trevino, is the church's stance on birth control out of touch? At one point in the Christian Church's history, the whole body of Christ was aligned in seeing birth control as immoral. Up until 1930, all Protestant denominations agreed with the Catholic Church's teaching, condemning contraceptive as sinful. At its 1930 Lambeth Conference, the Anglican Church announced that contraception would be allowed in some circumstances, and soon contraception was embraced across the board— Since then, all other Protestant denominations have followed suit. The Catholic Church alone proclaims the historic Christian position on contraception. So why is the Catholic Church so stubborn on this point? It would seem by the above description, it just hasn't kept up with the times. But Ramona Trevino has another view. It was, in fact, the Church's teaching on contraception that awakened her to the damage she was helping incur in working as a manager for Planned Parenthood. Eventually, she could no longer square her growing faith with her work, and she resigned and now works as a fervent defender of life. Though immersed in the cultural discussion of abortion, Ramona has a heart to illumine this other issue that is often overlooked as a key component to feeding abortion, that of contraception. She believes that if we could look at the issue of how birth control contributes to our culture's devastating acceptance of abortion, many would rethink birth control and turn to a more respectful approach to family planning, and in the process, curb the tide of abortion fanaticism. The only way to get further into Ramona's heart is by hearing her story. So let's travel digitally to Texas to meet her now. Well, welcome, Ramona. (laughs) How are you doing this morning? I'm fantastic. Awesome, awesome. Well, we've been talking about doing a podcast together since forever, since well before I started this Matters of Soul Importance. So I'm glad we finally were able to make it work. It's been hard because you have a very busy schedule. You just got back from Puerto Rico, right? I did, yes. And it was phenomenal. And I'm just so excited to finally be a guest. Oh, well, I am too. We've had many conversations through the years. Um, We worked on a big project together years ago, and that really um, pulled us into a friendship that I consider a treasure of my life. And I'm so grateful to remain in touch with you frequently. Um, We have a lot of good discussions about life, and we figure everything out, and then we hang up and then start all over when the next one comes. But it's not all just about... um, the issue that we're going to talk about today, which is, is the church's stance on birth control out of touch. But we, we just talk about life and, and our families and, um, and faith. And so those are, those are the important things, right? Yes. And the trials of motherhood and the challenges that come with, with being moms. And, and as you know, with being an empty nester now, it never ends. That's right. It's it's a lifelong commitment. You know, I was just saying a prayer this morning, just kind of thanking God for this time in my life where things are a little quieter, my brain can focus on different things. But at the same time, (laughs) I'm very aware that God hasn't um, relinquished my parenting duties and worries and prayers that 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 our families need. So it's just a different season, but um, very maybe even more intense in some ways. So um, you know, yeah, our, we're connected to our children forever, for eternity, and so um, that that role never ends. Once we're we're a, a mother, that's that's forever. So, um, well, let's start with your life of faith, since that's the topic of this podcast in general. I, I want to hear, even though I've heard it before, but it's always worth revisiting and, and sharing with others a little bit about how God first came into your life, like maybe a little bit about um, growing up and and where was God in that picture? What was the emphasis? Um, what kind of faith life did you have growing up? 
Yeah. So I think that's a beautiful question to, to begin with, because I think the easiest response would be, um, God came into my life during my baptism as a baby. So I'm a, a cradle Catholic, baptized as a baby. But, you know, I think like so many other Catholic families, we were a cultural Catholic family. So you just kind of went through the motions of the sacraments and baptizing your babies. And my mom and dad were married in the Catholic church. But uh, that was the extent of my of my sacraments, right? It was just the the baptism. And, you know, life happens. And I think, you know, being a mother now myself, I, I understand. I can look back in hindsight and understand kind of the position that my mom and dad were in. And, uh, but, but in spite of not having, you know, the faith formation and growing up in the church, the church was always present in my life one way or another. And that was either through just ex- being exposed to my mom uh, praying the rosary to having images uh, of Our Lady of Guadalupe in our home or, you know, s- my parents speaking about just having faith when things are difficult in life and um, <clears throat> and celebrating the holidays, it, 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 even though they weren't necessarily focused on, on faith or, you know, we didn't necessarily um, involve that we it was always important you know christ was always kind of at the center of christmas and easter so it was just kind of part of our culture but also yeah kind of in the background too and so god was always kind of you know obviously god is always present in our lives but i don't know that he was always front and center uh in my in by by my choice right um but he was always there and it was always kind of in the background can I ask you a question? Um, you mentioned Our Lady of Guadalupe. Not everyone listening here will know who she is. And I think you had a grandmother named after her too. So could you share a little yeah. bit about Our Lady of Guadalupe? Because oh, obviously that image. I love her. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and you were just in Mexico recently. I know you didn't get to go yes, to actually see yes. the site. But yeah, share a little bit about that. That was a um, phenomenal um, occurrence in, in our Christian history. Yes. Yeah, so Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, so let's see, where shall I begin? Well, both my mom, my grandma and my grandpa were both named Guadalupe. So my grandpa and grandmother both went by Lupe for short. Uh, one was, my grandfather was Guadalupe and my grandmother was Maria Guadalupe. And so they're both named after Our Lady of Guadalupe. But for those who aren't familiar, um, they may not be familiar with the story, but I'm Mm -hmm. sure many people are familiar with the image because- She is so ingrained in the Hispanic culture and especially in the Mexican culture because of her apparition. Um, I guess it would have been, I can't remember the exact date, but 1500 and yeah. something, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Yep. And uh, and so our, our Lady of Guadalupe, um, our Lady of the Virgin Mary, appeared to a, a native man, Saint Juan, now St. Juan Diego, and in Mexico, what is now Mexico City, uh, upon a hill, Tepeyac Hill. And that, you know, obviously he didn't know that it was Our Lady until she revealed to him that she was. And he asked for a sign to bring back to the bishop and uh, of her, of what she had said. And, and you know, she, uh, obviously there was a miracle of, of flowers, Castilian flowers, roses to be specific, that uh, that appeared there, and she he gathered. She instructed Saint Juan Diego to gather up the roses and put them in his tilma, which is a um, a, a fabric that's made by that was made by the the, the indigenous people out of um, aloe leaves or something. You know, like something you know okay. that they were using for those to make those tilmas. He gathered up all the roses and and he opened up his his tilma in front of the bishop and. And then the roses produce this image, this miraculous image of Our Lady, and uh, and it still exists after all these years. You know, more than five hundred years later, you can see the actual image. And uh, I had the the tremendous blessing of of visiting her and seeing the image for myself last year in Mexico City. And uh, and it's it's changed my perspective because growing up I had no idea of the story and I had no idea what I was looking at when I was looking at the image and now that I know it's just it changes everything. 
And of course, um, at the time, it was more of a pagan culture, would you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you imagine now she was responsible, that image alone was responsible for over 10 million conversions of indigenous people. And I think one of the revelations that I had recently, actually, was, and that was actually after your trip to Mexico City, that Mm -hmm. I had kind of this moment, aha moment, where I realized, wow, I'm Catholic today because of the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, because at some point my ancestors who were in, in my indigenous lineage, right, they they witnessed this for themselves firsthand mm-hmm. and were converted to the faith. And uh, when my great-grandparents came from Mexico, they still uh, embraced their Catholic identity and baptized their children as Catholics and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I'm very grateful that despite not having a very solid faith formation, I'm very grateful that we still embraced our Catholic faith and that I was baptized into the church. Right. And and you can draw on that heritage now and, and it's not lost and it's still there. It's still moving hearts. So um, as you grew up and, and went through your life, what were some of the uh, events that shaped you? I, you know, something that I remember very vividly is it, from my childhood is being I, around eight years old. And my, you know, my dad was an alcoholic for most of my life. And so we had, you know, we had a, a troubled childhood, you know, and, and it wasn't ideal in any way. Um, and I remember, you know, my mom and dad were, were arguing and, you know, the word divorce was kind of thrown around. And of course, as a child, it's terrifying to imagine your parents divorcing. And I just, I remember climbing up on top of the roof and sitting there and talking to God and the cloud, the, 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 the sky was seemingly clear. I mean, there was not, not a cloud in the sky and it was, it was nighttime and I'm just having this very innocent conversation with God and, and, and begging for God to, um, you know, protect my family and my, my parents and their marriage. And, and in the distance, the whole light, the, the sky lit up, you know, with, with lightning and it wasn't lightning bolts. It's, you know, when it's just, it just lights up, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for me, that for me, I think was this moment where I really truly felt God's presence, uh, in a tangible way and, and realized that he, he was real you know, that he was answering me in that moment. It, it was perfect timing. And of course, you know, you grow up and you, you you don't know what to do with any of those things, you know, when you don't have any guidance. And uh, and I remember as, as a teenager, maybe 12, 13 years old, I had watched um, The Song of Bernadette the movie, The Song of Bernadette for the first mm-hmm. time, which tells the story of, of uh, St. Bernadette and how Our Lady of Lourdes appeared to her in, in Lourdes, France. And I just, I just remember falling in love with Our Lady, you know, and not just Our Lady, but also considered even becoming a nun myself, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, so, and I remember just being this little kid and, and telling my mom, you know, I think I would love to be a nun. And I remember my mom saying, you know, I thought about that myself when I was your age, but that was it. That was the end of the conversation. You know, we never went further with that. And, um, and so again, you know, life happens. And one of the things that obviously dramatically changed my life was becoming a teen mother and becoming mm-hmm. pregnant at 16 and having my daughter at, at the young age of 17. Um, and I think that's really where everything began to shift in my life. Uh, just my whole worldview, both as a mother, but also being in an abusive relationship with her father for so long. Uh, it had such a dramatic impact on my life. Do you remember like a point at which God began to fill distance? W- w- was there a moment where you kind of just felt like he wasn't near anymore? Like he had been in that, in that flash of, of lightning when the sky lit up and, and you felt your heart move. I mean, h- how did, how did that connection sort of begin to fizzle out? What was it that made you feel like you couldn't maybe depend on him or trust him anymore? Was there a a moment or a phase or? You know, I don't know when I look back if there was ever a moment where I actually rejected, ever rejected God. Mm -hmm. I think if I really, you know, go back in hindsight and think about it and reflect upon it, I think I was, I knew God was there and I, knew that he was with me, 
but I almost felt as if I wasn't good enough to approach him. That Mm. I wasn't holy enough, you know, that I wasn't living my life according to what he wanted. And so I almost felt as if I wasn't um, worthy in a way to approach God. And, and so I, you know, of course we, we keep God at, at, at arm's length, you know, and I think that's what I was doing is just keeping God at arm's length, almost in a way afraid of approaching God, you know? And I think part Mm -hmm. of that too is, is the upbringing that I had. And, you know, when you have people like, you know, you know, your parents who they're not bringing you to faith formation and you don't really understand how God works. And, you know, one of the things that the misconceptions that we grew up with was that, you know, God would punish us, right? That God mm-hmm. would punish us if we didn't behave, you know? And and so right. you have this skewed misunderstanding of who God really is. And so I felt like a, a lot of my suffering and a lot of the things that I was dealing with meant that I wasn't good enough to come to God. We didn't do a lot of praying of the rosary or anything like that, but I was always drawn to Mary also. And I think for me, she was a soft mother that um, just was gentle and could kind of um, bring levity to to that feeling of being unworthy. I don't know if if that was your experience as well. Well, I think what happens oftentimes is we she's the mother that, that that she's filling a void that's missing in our lives, right? And so maybe if our own mother and my mother, God bless her, I love her, mm-hmm. you know, but she wasn't she wasn't very affectionate, you know, um, and and I was a very needy child. I I needed a lot of attention. I needed a lot of affection. I was always a very touchy feely person, <laughs> and <laughs> and and my mom wasn't wasn't and still isn't, you know, that way. Um, and so I think there's something beautiful in that Our Lady fills a void for us. And and I was always so drawn to her and her motherly love and her motherly care. And um, I think that that's true too of, of Christ, you know, that he fills that, obviously it's true of Christ, but, you know, he fills that void for us when we're missing, you know, the, the mm-hmm. what we're missing with in terms of our own fathers who fall short. Right. And I think it's sad that a lot of people do push away from um, God the Father when when they've had difficult relationships with men. But in fact, He can be the Father that fills in that void. But that's hard. That's There's an emotional, psychological block there sometimes. So um, so Our Lady can, can sometimes fill that if we're open to that. Ramona, let's let's go a little bit more into what was so you um you were a teen mother and in a like you said an abusive relationship um where did things go from there well i can tell you that you know when i was when i became pregnant at 16 i would have been the ideal candidate for an abortion right i think planned parenthood would have easily sold me the idea to abort but praise be to god it never crossed my mind. You know, abortion literally was just not a thought in my mind. And thankfully, my parents never considered it for me either. Um, The father of my daughter wanted me to have an abortion, and that should have been the first red flag, but I was extremely naive and didn't really recognize that that was problematic, right? Uh, And I think part of the abuse began as a result of me choosing life, and he Mm -hmm. resented me for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, because the abuse didn't begin until after I became pregnant and, and then it started to fall apart and he, he resented me for that. And, um, and so we were in a very, very toxic, unhealthy relationship for a very long time, almost nine years. And, you know, motherhood honestly was what saved me. I, I tell people all this, you know, tell people all the time that, you know, I don't know that I would be here today had I not become a mother because it was such a, um, it's sh- my daughter saved my life, you know, and, and it's just such a beautiful gift to have a child and to live for something or someone rather who gives you hope when you feel hopeless mm-hmm. and who gives you joy when you are living a life of despair. And for me, it was, that's how I felt. You know, I was hanging on by a thread most times, um, wanting to save my relationship. Because of course, you know, when you're in an abusive relationship, some days are great and some days aren't. And so you kind of hang on to the good 
and you grasp and you hang on for that, you know, you hang on to that. Um, but I think the, the part that, that blessed me the most was being a mother. And, you know, I was, I'm from a very small town where everybody knows everybody. And so when I became pregnant, it was just a scandal because I was the first girl to actually attend school pregnant. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a scandal. And of course, oh, Ramona has ruined her life and all of these other comments, you know, that you receive. And, and so I, I didn't think about it then, but now I realize what a, a courageous move it was on my part, you know, to, to have my daughter and to be unafraid and willing to face the world as a pregnant teen mom in a small town where everyone knew everyone. And, um, you know, I'm a Hispanic woman and we weren't, you know, I guess you would say we were poor in a way, you know, and uh, like I said, I would have been an ideal candidate for an abortion, but praise be to God, that didn't happen. And, uh, and again, it just changed the course of my life. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, you just kind of wonder if, if this were, you know, 20 years later, um, what might have, who knows? I, I think there wasn't as much internet talk. There wasn't, you weren't on TikTok telling Absolutely. you to shout your abortion. You know, it's kind of scary to think of what might have happened in, in a different time. But this is the time God placed you in, and, and, and your story is, is quite beautiful. But there was a, a, a bit of a setback. You at some point oh, ended yeah. up working for Planned Parenthood of all places. And that's, that's kind of a, a mystery for for those who <laughs> just heard you talk about how much you love your daughter and how she saved you. So tell us a little bit about how you ended up working for Planned Parenthood. Well, as you can imagine, Roxanne, it's taken me a long time to unravel that as well. <laughs> it's like, what in the world, you know? I think I've spent more time trying to figure out how did that happen, you know, and peeling back the layers and trying to understand because that's something that's always been important to me is just understanding, you know, and understanding the world and understanding people's decisions that they make and and really understanding myself and being self-aware. And so I think for me, you know, like... I look back and I realize, you know, Satan is so cunning in that he capitalizes on our uh, pain. He capitalizes on our sinfulness. Um, he capitalizes on our tragedy. He He's just really good at doing that. And I think, you know, obviously what happened it, it, for me, you know, like when I, when I go back and kind of analyze it, you know, I think... I had come out of this abusive relationship. I had finally found the courage and strength to to leave, right? And I'm a single mom and I had suppressed all of that pain. I, I didn't revisit it. I didn't seek healing. I didn't seek counseling. I suppressed it all and I tried to move on with my life. And um, shortly thereafter, I met my now husband of, of 18 years and, you know, he, again, I think he saved my life too. You know, we, we I met him at the right time and I was willing to give love a, another chance and we dated and we were engaged and we were confirmed in the Catholic Church, married in the Catholic Church, Our Lady of Guadalupe, by the way. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I think it was uh, just two years later. Yeah. Two years later, this opportunity presented itself to work for Planned Parenthood and, I accepted. And I think that's where everybody's just like, what? How did that, what was going on in your mind? And to be honest, I think there's a lot of things. I, number one, I justified working there because abortions were not performed at that facility. And two, I really believed I was helping prevent abortions and helping, um, young girls, from being in positions that I had found myself in. Uh, and again, I think that is because there's all of this emotion, psychological damage and emotional damage that I had suppressed and it, and it came out obviously in a different way. And it, and it came out in a way in which I was willing to put other young girls in harm's way versus trying to protect them. You know, I was willing to put girls in harm's way. Um, it's just kind of this skewed, mentality that I had of, oh, well, you know, I don't regret having my daughter at all, you know, and and I never did, never have. Uh, But working for Planned Parenthood, I thought if I can help a young girl, you know, and help her prevent from being in this position that I was once in, from being in an abusive relationship, from having, you know, a child from an abuser, then I want to be able to do that, you know. But I didn't Mm. realize then that I was just harming them even more. And is it true too that you were a little bit naive about what 
they actually did. I mean, um, and, oh, and, yes. and there, there were some logistical things, right, as far as the job fit your hours and, and you felt... Absolutely. Right. Perfect. So, it was perfect. It was it was the perfect opportunity. You know, it was three days a week. Uh, we were only open three days a week. I I wanted something part time. I was looking for something you know that could allow me to be at home. And um, I had a little a little toddler at home, and I wanted to be able to stay home and also work and contribute to our finances. And um, and so there was it was just like the perfect scenario. But you know, again. It, we are very naive, and I think a lot of people are in this country who um, aren't familiar with who Planned Parenthood is and what they're all about. And I, I definitely wasn't familiar. I thought, oh, Planned Parenthood, yeah, that's where women go to get birth control and a pap smear, right? I never knew where women went to get abortions, and I had never personally met a woman in my you know, life, uh, whether it be family or friends uh, or anyone close to me who had had an abortion. Obviously, I found out after the fact that, yeah, there had been, you know, people in my life who had confessed later to me, you know, that they had had an abortion and shared those secrets with me. But, you know, um, I had never met anybody who had had an abortion and didn't know where it was performed. And I really believed that it was rare. I really, truly believed the propaganda that, you know, abortion was safe, legal and rare in this country. And I had never I never did my homework going into Planned Parenthood. I just thought, oh, this is great. I'll be the clinic director and I will, um, you know, put this, put, get some experience, put this on my resume and then move on to something else later on. Before we go to a, a short break here, I tell us a little bit about what you did do because it wasn't an abortion um, facility, but what, what did you exactly do at that, at that clinic? Mm, yeah, so it was considered a uh, quote unquote family planning facility, and we were a part of the affiliate that um, of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. And so there were two surgical and chemical abortion centers in Dallas and Fort Worth, and then the rest of the facilities um, under that affiliate. I think there was maybe like twenty three or twenty four of them were referral facilities, and so we were, you know, the family planning arm of that affiliate, and so we. Um, provided birth control, STD testing and treatment, well woman exams, and um, pregnancy tests. And that was it. Well, at some point, uh, the light bulb went on and in a fairly dramatic way. So we're going to take a little break and then we're going to come back to hear more about um, how uh, the, the veil was lifted in, during your time at Planned Parenthood. So we'll be right back after this pause. Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit inforum.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. Well, welcome back to Matters of Soul Importance. We're talking here with Ramona Trevino, who uh, worked for a time at a Planned Parenthood facility in Texas, where she lives, near where she lives, um, but at some point began to realize that this wasn't an innocuous place to work and, and get something great put on her resume, but something else was happening. So um, Ramona, share about that journey and, and sort of the awakening. And, and then, of course, at some point, we'll bring the faith back into it, too, because that was a crucial part of of uh, your discovery. Um, but start wherever you want as far as um, your own personal journey of slowly realizing you were in a dangerous place. Right, right. Yeah, I think, you know, I went in there accepting that position under the impression that I would not have to associate myself with the with the issue of abortion. Because I think a lot of, I had the attitude that a lot of people have, which is, you know, abortion it, you know, is some, not something that I necessarily agree with. I wouldn't personally do it myself. I wouldn't personally, you know, advocate for it. But I believe it's a woman's right to choose, right? And I think, again, it goes back to being uh, indoctrinated with that propaganda my entire life of in the background, you know, that 
that the euphemism of choice and reproductive health care. And, you know, and, and you think, oh, well, you know, it should be safe, legal, and rare, and it's a woman's body and it's her choice, right? My body, my choice. And so you hear these slogans and the euphemisms and you just kind of accept it as truth. And I never really challenged myself on it. And it wasn't a topic we talked about, you know, at home. I didn't grow up uh, in an environment where we we ever discussed it because I think part of that is being, you know, Hispanic and being in a very uh, part of a culture that is very pro-life. It just is something that you don't ever think about, you know, and mm -hmm. um I think we're just all inherently pro-life and that was part of my culture too, despite being an American, you know? Yeah. Um, and so just accepting that position, I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll never really have to deal with abortion firsthand that's done somewhere else. And so that's really how I rationalized my position is that, you know, we're the same as a gynecologist's office. We're not any different. You know, the abortions are done else elsewhere. But obviously, you know, I was referring women for abortion. And so they were coming in, you know, and, and if they were pregnant, they wanted a referral and I had to, to give them that. And I think that was really where I was confronted for the first time with the issue. But again, I did such a good job of suppressing the things that bothered me. And so I washed my hands of those, you know, situations, so to speak, and would, you know, kind of do mental gymnastics and say, well, you know, that's her choice. You know, if she chooses to do that, it's, it's I have nothing to do with that. Right. And, and again, just kind of suppressing that. But, you know, it's interesting as much as I've made an effort to kind of have this out of sight, out of mind mentality in terms of abortion, what I could not ignore was what was happening in front of me every day. And what was happening was you know, seeing these young girls come into Planned Parenthood without their parents, you know, like 15, 16, 17 year old girls without their parents living uh, promiscuous lifestyles and seeking birth control. You know, many of them oftentimes coming in for treatment for STDs, you know, repeatedly. And, um, and then watching them walk out the door with this birth control in tow, right? And I think that was what really began to weigh on my soul. Because as a mother, I, I not only had my own teenage daughter and stepdaughter, you know, that at home, um, but I was I was essentially watching, you know, these girls come in who could be my daughter, you know, and mm -hmm. and their parents didn't know that they were engaging in very risky behavior, uh, and it and it broke my heart. It really did. It broke my heart because I knew that these young girls deserved better them being objectified and being used and tossed to the side. It just was very painful to watch. It's interesting. You know, one thing caught me that I hadn't thought so much about before in your story, and that was this promise of choice. And, and I'm thinking about, you know, being in an abusive relationship. I can see, I can totally see how choice became a very important thing because you felt powerless in that situation. And so all of a sudden, now, now you are rising up and kind of um, re, re, regaining that power through choice, right? And so I, I see, yeah, I see how how uh, alluring it is, and because people yeah. are hurt, people have been hurt, people have been uh, misguided and neglected, and and um, you know not brought to to Christ in a way that would would be helpful to them, and so um, it, it makes sense. You know, we have to have it make sense, and it as you hear all of that, it, it is like the psych psychological aspect of it. But now choices seeming a little in question, right? Because you're seeing the damaging effects of it. Yeah, and and you know, just to back up a little bit, Roxanne, what you've said here is just so powerful. It's such a powerful statement because that is really the crux of the issue is that, you know, these women, these young girls oftentimes are in, you know, these relationships where, you know, I don't think that it is their choice to be objectified. I don't think that they're it's their choice to give themselves to, you know, maybe a boyfriend who they, you know, thought they loved and then, you know, get tossed to the side because you know, now he's gotten what he wanted from her and there's no other way to go for them. They feel as if there's no other way to go, right? So like, okay, well now this is the trajectory of my life and I'm going to continue to choose being, you know, promiscuous because now I, I can choose this for myself, you know, and, and they, it's almost this false sense of empowerment and this lie, again, a lie mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 
faux feminism, feminists and lie from, you know, pro aborts who, who are trying to convince women that somehow this is empowering and it isn't. And it, and it starts all the way back from, you know, having, uh, premarital sex, you know, that this, this somehow is empowering and liberating. And I never saw one woman or young girl or, you know, who came into Planned Parenthood who seemed liberated or who Mm. seemed empowered in any way. If anything, they, they walked in and out and there was a shame. There was a look of shame, you know, I never saw them come in and I thought to myself, oh, wow, look at her. She's so empowered. You know, I never Mm. saw that. And it didn't matter what age they were. Um, because deep down inside, we weren't created and designed to do and behave, like do these things and behave in this way. We were meant for more. Yeah. Uh, You know, the, the fact that you had teenage daughters in your life really became a cornerstone for how you were processing all this, which is so beautiful because had you not had your daughter and your stepdaughter, um, there to make that connection for you, you may not have have made it, but you did. And, and, and that was like, um, you couldn't rectify those two things. Um, so, so, so then what happened? Like, how did you deal with that? And what were some other episodes, I guess, that sort of continued to enlighten you, um, to what Planned Parenthood really was about at the bottom? Yeah. So one of the other things I think that was very eye opening is, is Planned Parenthood's willingness to, cover up statutory rape, their willingness to aid and abet in underage sex trafficking, which was exposed by Lila Rose in live action back in 2011. And, um, and I, and I lived it, you know, I lived it and I, and I was there and I, and I remember, you know, seeing cases where young girls came in who were in statutory rape situations and we were instructed to just change the, the age of the boyfriend. Um, you know, we were, we were, it was too, too much trouble, you know, to fill out those forms and, and report and make reports. Right. Uh, and then you realize, okay, wait a second, you know, these girls are in statutory rape situations, but they're still walking out the door with their birth control in hand. So that tells me that we're, we're, we're an accomplice, right? We were, we're continuing to say to her, well, you're in this statutory rape situation. We've made a report, but you know what? You're not leaving here without birth control because God forbid, you know, she become pregnant as if that's the worst thing that could happen to her. Uh, you know, but she doesn't get pregnant, but she's still going to be abused. Right. Um, and I think I was struggling to reconcile that and, and I could see it happening in front of me. And I couldn't really figure out what was really wrong. You know, I was like, okay, there's something Mm -hmm. wrong here, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it, right? Because you don't really, you can't process, you're processing it, but you're really not um, able to articulate it emotionally or even, you know, mentally uh, what you're witnessing. And so it's your job and it's how you're getting paid. And so you, I think there's the blinders, like we we all have blinders for different things and focus on one thing over the other, you know, um, you're focusing on keeping your family. And you're trying to justify too. You're trying to justify your position. Like you, Mm -hmm. I don't want to be wrong, you know, because obviously, you know, we had protesters on the sidewalk and they'd had you know, times where they'd engage, engaged with me and, you know, kind of wanted to tell me why I was wrong and working there. And you, and I'm, I was such a rebellious person that I don't want anyone telling me why I'm wrong, because if you're going to tell me why I'm wrong, I'm going to push back and I'm going to prove that I'm right. Right. And so mm-hmm. I needed to continue to justify why I was working there, but it became more and more difficult to do. The yeah, more that it- things were revealed to me, it was just became more yeah. difficult to defend Planned Parenthood. When you were changing those ages, did you have to do that yourself? And and um, what did that do to you inside when you're like lying? You're helping the the organization lie. Oh gosh, it was tor- it was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, you you're literally shutting off your conscience, right? You're you you've got this voice inside of you. All of us do. That's telling you something's wrong, and then you're just ignoring that against really your, your own will, right? You're just, you know, that your conscious is screaming at you. This is wrong. This is wrong. And, and I still did it. And you realize, you know, gosh, I look back and I'm like, I lacked so much integrity and what a coward, you know, I was that I, I couldn't have the courage to just do what was right. 
Hmm. And so that's what, difficult. You know, that's difficult yeah. to go back and look at that person and go, wow, what a coward. But, but Ramona, at some point, something else took over. And we oh, yeah. all have moments in our life where we, we don't see it. We don't want to see it. We cover our eyes and move on. But something at some point just made you stop in your tracks. So, so, so what was that that finally made you <laughs> halt? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's the strangest thing when I say it out loud. I just, you know, you know how it is. You tell this story and you're like, this is so crazy, right? Catholic radio. God reached me through Catholic radio. And it was the craziest thing because I just kind of stumbled upon it, you know, and I realized it wasn't that I stumbled, you know, God was, was trying to reach me and he knew exactly how to reach me. And I think that's what's most beautiful, you know, for our listeners too, to, to think about how God knows us so intimately. He knows us so well that he knows exactly how to reach us. And, and that was the perfect media. Like that was the perfect way for God to reach me because it was in private. It was in my car. I was alone. No one was around. There wasn't, you know, somebody on the sidewalk telling me something, you know what I mean? It wasn't a family mm-hmm. member or a friend. It was just me and the radio. And God used this radio program to expose me first to women who are, you know, were Christian Catholic women calling into the program, sharing their experiences with abortion, having had an abortion. And I think that was like, whoa, what? You know, I had no idea that Christian women had abortions. So I think that was like the first jarring moment that kind of just opened my eyes to the reality of how prevalent this is, right? And, Mm -hmm. And the second part was about contraception. And the term abortifacient came up and I'd never heard that term before. And I had been using contraception for many years at that point. And, um, and to hear for the first time that there is an abortifacient property to hormonal contraception it just was stopped me in my tracks. And, I, and that was kind of that aha moment in a way, um, even though it hadn't really, I mean, it, there, was, there was a shift, obviously. but. Um, it was more like, what? This can't be true. You know, this this can't be true. This priest is, has to be lying because there's no way that birth control can be an abortifacient. And if, if so, what does that mean for me? What does that mean if I've been using contraception for all of these years, I could potentially have aborted a child through chemical means without, no, without knowing, right? There's a possibility, you know, there's no mm-hmm. way to know. And so that kind of changed everything and set my whole conversion in motion. Well, if anything, that stubbornness um, can can be a good thing in that moment, right? Because you're you're not willing to. If, if that is true, I guess you could say too that truth was important to you, right? And, oh, and yes. um, you could avoid it for only so long, and then one, once it hits you, you weren't going to just um, shoo it away. Yeah, the, truth, yeah. knowledge, all of those things are are important to me and always have been important to me. And if there's something that I didn't know and someone says, oh, you didn't know this, and then they tell me, okay, I want to know more about that. You know, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I, I guess you could also say I'm kind of a, a little bit of a know-it-all or I want to be a know-it-all. Um, but, but if I didn't know this about birth control, then I wanted to, number one, challenge it and find out if this is true or not. Because in a way it was again that that rebelliousness of like, mm. oh, wait a second, this priest doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm gonna look right. further into this, right? And I did. I went home that night and pulled out the FDA insert of my birth control pills and it was there in black and white. Wow. And I couldn't I could not believe it. I needed a magnifying glass to read it. <laughs> but I was I was shocked because no one had ever told me that. No one had ever told me that in, you know, like my doctor who prescribed it, nor working for Planned Parenthood, did I ever know that there was an abortifacient property to birth control pills and hormonal birth control. Right. And now you're kind of reaching a crisis point a little bit with your work too, because I can see why you wanted to drill into that because you wanted to be able to free, have a free conscience in what you were doing at your work, which was dispensing birth control. And so right. now, now you, um, cause you went in with, with what you thought were pure intentions to help. Right. And now you're realizing that you're, there's a abortion component to what you're doing in more ways than one. Yeah. You know, the, the abortion component, but then also 
you know, when you start, <laughs> you know, like everything starts to unravel, right? Little by little. And it's quite incredible to think back how someone who had no previous theological training or no previous knowledge of, you know, the church's teaching on abortion, other than just, oh, the, uh, not church teaching abortion, but of contraception, other than, oh, the Catholic church, you know, teaches against contraception. But I really didn't dive into the why and really get to the bottom of understanding um, the why. And the reason I contracepted was kind of like a two for one because I suffer from endometriosis. And so that was always the band-aid that doctors put on endometriosis was contraception. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm contracepting because I have endometriosis and it just kind of works as a two for one because it's helping treat that, but it's also um, preventing me from getting pregnant which, you know, I ultimately learned that it wasn't treating anything. It was just covering it up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a spiritual component to this too. I, I don't know if you're ready to jump into that, but um, why, why don't we, if you're, if you're thinking that, that would, this is the right time, because um, there was the, the aha moments you were having in your own conscience and heart. And then something also was happening to you as far as your faith life, which you yes. kind of also put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. God's timing is always perfect. And so it, I was having this aha moment. And I think that is kind of where there was this big shift in the world, right? Like my whole world started to shift and change. And I felt almost as if the ground was, you know, falling away from me. And I was like, what is going on? Right. Um, and there was suddenly this desire to reconcile myself with God for what I was doing. And, you know, it, I'd like to say it happened very quickly, but I guess now looking back, it, it happened very slowly because this transpired during Advent. The stumbling upon Catholic radio happened during Advent, right before Christmas. And then there was just kind of this slow progression, right, of, of things changing. And I was listening to Catholic radio on, on my drive to and from work three days a week and just learning new things, almost as if I was being catechized, you know, for the first time mm -hmm. uh, about my faith and just different subject matters and especially on the life issues. And I think those little seeds just continued to be planted until I was, you know, getting prepared to, um, we were headed into Lent. And as we were headed into Lent, I felt that God was tugging on my heart to go to confession um, to pray the rosary every day and to go back to mass as I hadn't been to mass, you know, and I was, um, when I first started working for Planned Parenthood, I was going to mass on Sundays and, um, I had no idea that what I was doing was wrong. And then to, at one point I just stopped going because I felt as if I wasn't welcome at mass. No one ever told me mm -hmm. I wasn't welcome. I just sensed like God didn't want me there. And so I stopped going altogether. But then I felt God calling me back. And so confession was the big first step. And uh, and my priest, you know, I told him where I was working. And I was so afraid, you know, to tell him. And he said, Ramona, you know, I know it's going to be really difficult for you, but you need to quit your job as soon as possible. And I thought, okay, I think I can work with that, right? As soon as possible. He's not telling me, like, quit your job tomorrow, right? Um because, you know, I had adulting to do and I had bills to pay and I couldn't just quit my job without another job. Meanwhile, you know, all of this is happening to me and something else amazing is happening. Uh, the first 40 Days for Life campaign is about to kick off in front of my former workplace. And the only reason I knew about it was because I'd heard the advertisement on Catholic radio. Mm -hmm. And it's just incredible to think about how our le the leader um, of that campaign Jerry, he he had chickened out before to lead, and then he finally mustered up the courage to to lead that campaign, and and he would have never known what was happening, you know, behind those doors at Planned Parenthood. You know, he would have never known that hey, there's this woman in there, right, who's managing mm -hmm. this facility that God's working on, and and I'm going to come and show up, and we're going to pray her out of there, right? I, I, he would have never known that, and so you know, Jerry decides to lead this campaign. And I hear about the advertisement and I felt God calling me um, and saying to me that this is kind of my chance. This is my opportunity because it was a peaceful prayer vigil. 
And because it was a peaceful prayer vigil, I never felt threatened by their presence. It wasn't a protest. It was just, you know, they were going to show up, pray and fast and be on the sidewalk, right? I thought, Mm -hmm. wow, maybe this is God's way of saying, you know, this is my chance to go out and ask for prayers and support. And on the third day of the campaign, that's what I did. I went out, I asked someone to pray for me. Jerry ends up showing up a little while later. And uh, before you know it, all of this this huge community of pro-lifers and and uh, Christian people and Catholics and all faiths, they're praying for me to leave Planned Parenthood. And they're helping me uh, try to find another job. They, they asked for my resume and that they were going to circulate it and, and do whatever they could to help me take that leap of faith and quit my job. Wow. I, th- like just reviewing that again with you and as a sidewalk advocate myself, we pray for something like that all the time. But as far as I know, it's never happened in the over, you know, decade or more that I've been doing that. It's just amazing to realize what happened there. And yeah. and that, that the, and that <laughs> but you didn't really even know. You were you no. were just kind of like just needed someone <laughs> to pray for you. Yes. <laughs> That's so yes. awesome. Yes, it's like I I you know, it's it's very funny, you know, how God works in our lives because you know, now I work for 40 Days for Life, the national team, and never in a million years, you know, like I yeah. I was going through my own personal crisis, right, during that time. Because, you know, we talk about women who are in a crisis pregnancy, who, you know, we're trying so fervently to, to spare the life of not just her child, but spare these mothers and fathers from a lifetime of pain and regret, right? We talk about that, and we, but we don't think about the crisis in the soul of someone who's going through a conversion. And for Mm -hmm. me, it was like, it was such a spirit. It wasn't a spiritual crisis in the sense that what I was headed to was bad, right? It was good, obviously. But going through the process was was so difficult because now my whole worldview has changed. Now I'm just like, you know, I'm the one going through it in my home. No one else is going through this with me, right? I feel by myself like I'm alone. Um. I I need another job. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find another job. I want to quit so badly and I don't know what to do. You know, like there's all of these things going on and it's it's quite a, a very, it's very heavy and it's very dramatic in your life, you know, when you go mm-hmm. through something like this because everything changes for you. Everything. Right. Right. And um, and there was no way for anyone to know that. So the thing is, is that had it not been for 40 Days for Life and the people who were praying for me, I don't think I've ever, I would have ever gotten through that time. I don't. I really don't. Mm. Because they were the ones who sustained me um, by their prayers. They sustained me through prayer. They sustained me through their support, through their love. And it's incredible to experience something like that with complete strangers who are literally loving you and despite your sinfulness, despite the fact that I was working in Planned Parenthood um, through the duration of all those 40 days, right? And they were still praying for me and loving me. And that, uh, like, I still think back in that time and it just still gets me emotional because I've never experienced something like that in my life. You know, there's another word that's coming to me, and we've talked about this word before, but humility. I mean, on on some level, you were kind of flat out on the ground, you know, like spiritually or or emotionally, mentally, to be able to go out and face that crowd and not, you know, just take take the chance that they might be judging you. Um, your your need to reconnect with God and have prayer like trumped any, you know, your own pride, you know, that stubbornness, whatever, like that was all kind of went away and you just, you just like kind of approach them like a child, like just, is there anything you can do for me? No, I agree. It's just interesting to think of what led to that. Now, I I do want to make sure we talk about birth control because there's a couple of different components to that. Um, I I think it's so widely accepted and so many people don't understand the connection and you've used the phrase and I've heard others use the phrase and I've, I've heard this, I've, I've used the phrase and and been challenged um, by others who don't understand, but that that birth control is a gateway to abortion. Do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about that and and what it does to 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 people that we we don't even really understand um, the effects? But share a little bit about what your discovery has been since you worked. Do we have another hour to talk yeah, about? This? I know we might have to <laughs> may have to do another do show two. for sure. Yes, no, it's yeah. incredible because it. 
you know, I think it's incredible how God first opened my eyes to the connection of um, between contraception and abortion. First, on a very practical level, you know, of the abortifacient properties of birth control. Then you start getting into, you know, the um, the theological component, right? And and really understanding how contraception opened the door to birth control. And I think it was, I think, 1968, no, 1965, Mm -hmm. when birth control was legalized in the U.S. And then in 1972, there was another case in where it um, became legal. I I don't know exactly if it was already legal across the country or maybe in 1972, it then became, you know, nationwide. But it was right before um, Roe, you know, 1972 and and then a year later. there, yeah, the 1968, which is the year I was born, was the year that Humanae Vitae came out. The church That's right. um, came out with an encyclical in kind response of like, to. Yes, yeah. So yes. that was in the middle of those two things, um, kind of right. explaining the theological aspect of the procreative and the unitive working together, and that you can't separate those. Babies and bonding is another way to put it. That those two go together, and so once you 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 cut one off, there's problems. Yeah. And we, and we see the fallout today. And so, you know, when I talk about the birth control and abortion being two sides to the same coin, it's true. And we see it, we're seeing it, we're witness to it right now uh, today, you know, and it's incredible to me because, you know, there's been 65 million plus abortions in our country since Roe v. Wade, right? Um, But before Roe v. Wade, contraception was already legal. And so a lot of people come to the conclusion that, oh, well, you know, people need to be on birth control because if they're on birth control, it would prevent abortions. And my response is, if it prevented abortions, then why do we have 65 plus million abortions today after the legalization of contraception? And that is because there's all of the fallout as a result of, again, like you mentioned, when you disconnect um, the procreative nature with the a uh, bonding nature of sex, then you start to have problems. And, you know, God has a design for human sexuality. And whenever you, you know, veer from that plan, from God's plan and design for human sexuality, as is with anything, anytime we do anything outside of God's plan and design for humanity, we're going to have problems. Right. And this is why we have problems. Right. And one of the church's responses is natural family planning, which you and mm-hmm. I have both learned and employed. And and um, it, it's, a, it's a whole different approach. But when I was thinking about that this morning, I know that also is misunderstood because there's the rhythm method of old, but this is, this is um, taking theology and science really, mm-hmm. and, and bringing them together along with faith and trust in God. And um, as we know, um, the majority of people that practice that have have stronger marriages on the whole. Um, so there, there's so many benefits. It's free. <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to go in and get pills. It doesn't have any negative effects at all. There's no chemicals or anything being put into your body. So I think there's a fair amount of people who are um, naturally minded, want to do natural medications and things like that, that are attracted also to uh, this kind of method for child spacing. And and yet it honors, um, it honors the conscience too, um, and, and brings men and women into a conversation rather than just saying, no, no, this is going to, we're going to, you know, we're just going to stop this part of it. So I don't know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I was going to say too, that, you know, Pope Paul VI, who wrote mm-hmm. Humanae Vitae in 1968, he uh, was prophetic in his writing. It, he was prophetic in that encyclical, which I recommend any listener, all listeners, to to read Humanae Vitae because it was so prophetic. And he, you know, what he said would happen as a result of, um, you know, acceptance of contraception would happen, and it did. And that's what's quite yeah. quite incredible. I'll put that in the show notes because um, it isn't really that long. It, yes, it's a little thick in, in terms of like, you know, popes don't always um, have a easy, uh, you know, it's a little bit thick theologically, but actually I, I read it um, early on as a mother and, and was able to grasp it and actually found it quite beautiful and profound. And I think if anyone wants to like argue the church's stance and why um, so many years everyone in Christendom was on board and and, and suddenly it shifted. Um, 
well, it, it didn't wasn't suddenly, but um, you know, there was cultural aspects of that changing too. Um, but why why is why is this one church like stubborn about this? You mm-hmm. know, there's a, there's a reason. There, and there I love is a that, reason. I love that you want to find out the reason for things because I I'm like that too. Like I will follow the rules, but I need to know why. I need to know why the rule is there. What once I know, it's like oh. It makes sense. There's reasons mm-hmm. that we have rules and laws and things like that. They're to protect us. Um, and But I need to know the whys also. And, and then yeah, I can and I think, follow. Mm-hmm. Sorry. No, I was going to say, and I think that if I had not worked for Planned Parenthood, I may not have completely grasped and understood Humani Vitae. But being, you know, leaving, ultimately having a conversion and quitting my job and leaving Planned Parenthood, um, it it revealed so much to me. And then you go back and you read Humana Vitae and you're like, whoa, this all makes sense. I can, it all makes sense that women will be objectified, that you lose, you know, this sense of sacredness. The woman loses this sense of sacredness, you know, that she's revered. She's no longer revered in the same way as life bearing and life giving. And, um, you know, you see, you'll see pornography, the use of pornography, pornography being um, expanded and and um, people addicted. You know, we have this issue today, you know, with so many marriages who are struggling and relationships struggle because they're addicted to pornography. And, you know, and then the government mandated abortions and uh, like in China and uh, so many things that he was so, it was so prophetic and obviously from the Holy Spirit, straight from the Holy Spirit. And so when you go back and you read that as someone who now is on both sides, has been on both sides, you're blown away. I, I'm blown away because mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, wow, I lived it when I was on Planned Parenthood side and I saw and I witnessed all of this. And now I'm on this side and I can, it all makes sense. It well, all makes and, sense. And, you know, one of the biggest ones is um, conse- consequence free sex. Yes. Which has led to so many issues, including things like infidelity and divorce, even. And but but think about how insidious it is here. Take this pill, and we can do whatever we want, and without consequences. Oops, it mm-hmm. didn't work. It didn't work. Which is why we have sixty-five plus million abortions, <laughs> right? Because- so now we got to go go take care of that thing and get it get it get rid of it. Yeah, because the contraception was supposed to work, right? Right. Like that's that's the thing is that they're like, wait a second, the 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 condom or the pill or whatever their people are using, it was supposed to work and now it has failed. And so what do they turn to? Abortion. Right. Because the whole reason... I was Sorry, saying, pre- preg- pregnancy becomes a liability too. Now it's not a natural, beautiful thing. It's a thing to fear and to fight against and to get rid of. Right. We're right. now, instead of being seen as life bearers, it, it's a problem to be a woman. And, and, yeah. I, and maybe it's even an issue where you don't even want to be a woman because <laughs> you don't want to deal with that. I don't, you know, there's a whole other implication we could go into that, but um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's insidious. It's insidious. It's this little, little promise that um, we can do this and we can forget about the amazing co-creation of life, cap- the capacity that God has given us to be co-creators of life with him. That is a human humongous responsibility, a tremendous responsibility and gift. And now we have taken that out of God's hands and said, we're not going to coke, we're going to get get rid of you and decide for ourselves completely. This is our will. That's absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and then you have this mentality of, I should be able to have sex with whomever, whenever I want and just give, give way to my, my desires, right? Just not even practice any type of self-control. And once I would do that, um, if I'm using some form of contraception and it fails and you become pregnant, then you turn to abortion. And sadly, you know, that's, that's why we're at where we're at today. And people don't understand that this, this is why, because if you have contraception, the natural progression to that is abortion. You, because you've been, you've, if you're utilizing contraception, it is because you're closed off to life. That's the whole reason right. you contracept, contra- which means conception. contra, you know, against conception, right? You yeah. don't want to conceive. And so even in your marriage, you're saying, I am closed off to life. I'm closed off to the gift of life. So I'm going to use this birth control pill. And uh, and the whole point is because we don't want babies. 
And so you've already adopted now into the culture this yeah. mentality that is anti-life, this mentality that is saying, we don't want children. We don't like children. Children are a burden. Children are a consequence of, you know, a negative consequence, mm-hmm. right? And so when you've adopted and embraced this mentality, the natural progression is to accept uh, to accept abortion. Yeah. One of the things I do want to say, because I know we feel pretty passionate about this, but we also, both of us have come at this through the cultural lens first. I, I myself um, kind of bought into it, but really part of it was I had married a Protestant and I just didn't think he would go along with the Catholic thing. So I was very slow to um, to totally embrace it. But at some point I did and it changed everything because I did, there were questions I still had about church teaching. But once I was able to embrace this one and wrap my brain around it and understand Humanae Vitae and see the beauty in it, and, and, and be open to life, um, everything else fell into place. And it, it, it like all the blinders came off from all the other areas. So it, it, there was such a freedom in bringing God back into that. And it, it has produced beautiful fruits in our marriage. I mean, there, it, it's so, but I want to say that um, for those that are, have bought into it, you know, it is a process. And, and um, I would just I pray about it, read Humanae Vitae, read what the church really does believe about it, and even maybe even the breach where where Protestants and Catholics diverged on that. But there is this connection. And we really, Ramona, I think you'd agree, can't have a conversation about abortion without t- talking about birth control and contraception. Correct. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And and to go back to your point about the strengthening the fruits of marriage, you know, when I left Planned Parenthood, Right before I left, actually, during that time of my conversion, I embraced natural family planning. And I think that was kind of that first big miracle that God yeah. gave me during that time because my husband embraced natural family planning with me, which was incredible because, you know, we'd been using contraception. And then for him to just go along and be like, okay, yeah, we'll do this, you know. And then the, as a result, we conceived our first child. And, and it was because I knew that I was fertile. And it was the first time it, we chuckle because out of all of our children, he's the one that we knew we were going to um, conceive because everybody else has just mm-hmm. been kind of like, oh, surprise, you know, and mm-hmm. we're like, okay, you know, we're pregnant. But but this was our first conversion baby, so to speak. And mm-hmm. we knew we were going to conceive because I was entering into a fertile period. And that gave my husband the opportunity to say yes or no you know, to the yeah. act um, that would, would conceive him. And so that's, I think, again, it produced so so many beautiful fruits. And part of that is strengthening the bond that you have in marriage and recognizing that you're not using each other, that you are being a, you, you have moments in where you do need to abstain if you're not wanting children for serious reasons at that time, right? right. And so, um, and that's what strengthens, ultimately is strengthening marriages because then they shift from it being a physical thing to now being focusing on the emotional uh, well-being of the other. It is a hard thing to grasp. The culture has a very, very different message. But as you've stated, Ramona, where that goes is devastating. It really is devastating. And not everyone experiences that maybe in a vivid way, but it's underlying and it's it's working its way through our culture. And I would say just like you know, Pope Paul the Sixth, um, he predicted that we would we would start to go downhill in very dramatic ways, and I think we're seeing that. And some would probably contest, like, "Oh, that's it's not all because of birth control," but honestly, a lot of it is. Would Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. When you look at a, a lot of things that are ailing our culture, with you know the the sexual revolution in the '60s and the way that women have um, allowed themselves to be degraded. In, in terms of the way that they behave and the way they dress and the way they, um, you know, no longer accept the beauty and the gift that is motherhood, you know, we it's tragic. And and again, the the addiction to pornography, the sex trafficking, all of these things, even even you know, sex trafficking and pornography of of children. I think that is where you mm. really go. Wait a second, you know, where, how far we've come, right? Like this is this is horrific. And, and you look at it and you go, yeah, this is a fallout of birth control because we've separated sex from marriage, 
from procreation, from something that is meant to be beautiful and holy, and we've perverted it. And and the reason that we've we see that is is you can see the timeline and you can look and see where this all progressed and how it progressed so quickly after the legalization of contraception. Well, I always admire and just am in awe of your conversion story and how you were having this conversion of heart, of soul, and also just like your everyday living. And and there's so much more we could share, but we probably will have to do a part B. And I, I'm serious about that. I, I would love to have you on several more times because there's so so many things that we could discuss. But um, any other like kind of concluding thoughts, maybe about maybe to address people out there that are like, wait a minute, this is like, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. What, what would you say? Or maybe someone um, who's in a situation, a difficult situation, maybe an abusive situation. Um, I, I don't know. Um, throw out your best wisdom out there, Ramona. Yeah, well, I don't know if it would be the best wisdom, but you know, I think the the thing that I want people to know, the listeners to know, is that we're not coming from this as as a as a judgment. Mm-hmm. We've lived it. You and I have been, you know, we've lived our lives um, kind of on both sides on this issue. Uh, yeah. For me, being on the Planned Parenthood side, using birth control for many many years. Um, you yourself said that you also did. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we're not coming from this at an angle of judging people. We're, we're, we're just sharing our lived experiences and hoping that people understand that we're empathetic, that we do, we do empathize with the plight of women who are in crisis, um, with married couples who, you know, are struggling to embrace natural family planning. We, we understand these things, you know, mm-hmm. and, and we've come to the other side, side of this, but not without cost, right? We, Absolutely. we, we've gone through it. We've gone, I, I, you know, I, I always tell people I've been through hell and back, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was not an easy road. And, you know, people probably think, oh, Ramona, you make it sound so easy. And it, it, and it, and it isn't, and it wasn't easy. None of it was, but it was so worth it. And I think that's, if I could leave any parting message to people, it's that, you know, have courage and have faith that nothing is impossible with God. And that, you know, when we lean on Him and we pray and we um, seek Him, He does He does not abandon us and He shows up in very um, big, mighty ways that we could, you know, never imagine, in ways that we could never imagine. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Amen. And then I just want to ask the question that we started with, just to give your one-liner answer, whatever it takes. Is the church's stance on birth control out of touch, Ramona? Absolutely not. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And I think we, I think you've made the case for that. And I just hope that it um, prods people because I think this is an issue that is easily um, tossed aside as important. I love that um, your heart is to bring awareness to it. And it's not easy. It's a controversial topic. We know that. But there's something beautiful in the middle of all that, Ramona, and your story is a testimony to that, a beautiful testimony. We also wrote your book together, um, and so Redeemed by Grace, that's still available online um, if you, anyone wants to hear more about Ramona's story. But thank you so much for um, conversing with me today on this tough topic, but with so many beautiful little moments of light in there. Thank you, Ramona. Well, thank you for having me, Roxanne. Is the church's stance on birth control out of touch? Ramona Trevino made a powerful case for an affirmative and emphatic answer, no. What's out of touch, she might say, is the world's imagining that birth control has and will continue to lead us to freedom. That seemed to be the rally cry of the feminists in the late 1960s and early 1970s as oral contraception began to become embraced by the culture. The promise was that this was the key to our freedom, sex without consequences. Make love, not war. I agree that avoiding war is a worthy goal, but like Ramona, I also agree that sexual intimacy separated from the natural beautiful result of its main purpose, the creation of children, is a recipe for disaster. We don't have to wonder about this anymore. We are living inside of the destruction that the birth control pill and other methods of contraception has wrought. Can we look honestly at the truth here? If we want to have a truly productive conversation about the ills of abortion, can we see that contraception must also be introduced? This is a hard thing, 
because we are so seeped in the contraceptive mentality that even many Catholics have disregarded its dangers. But in 1968, Pope Paul VI laid out the beautiful vision of God when it comes to sexual intimacy. Nearly, if not every ill we're facing in society right now has a tie to contraception. It's time we face that and ask for God's help in opening our eyes fully to the reality that birth control has not given us freedom, but has bound us in chains. Ramona and I have had many conversations about this, and she emphasizes it in her memoir as well. Let's not duck this important topic because it's scary. Ramona and I have both found that peering into the topic of contraception honestly brings an unparalleled peace of conscience. Well, in our next episode, just in time for Halloween, we'll ask an exorcist, are the devil and hell real? Until next time, don't lose sight of the light.